So our next presenter will be Pierre-Luc Brulliet, Mountmaker, uh, Annie Gaudier, Exhibition and Internal Relationship Director uh, for the MNBAQ uh, Museum, Quebec, Canada, Quebec City. Uh, and the title is From Nature to Display, The Fragile Balance in Manasee Akpalapik's Pal Work. <laughs> Hi everyone, we'll be uh, starting with a short video. In my culture, we always depend on the things that we can create to survive. You have to be creative in order to survive in the environment like the Arctic. When we talk about someone carving, we refer them as Senangwakto, which means pretending to work. So I guess I've been pretending for about 45 years. <laughs> I was born in a little outpost camp about 30 miles away from Arctic Bay, in a tent in August. No hospital, no doctors. We lived in a nomadic way, traveled by dog team, lived in igloos and lived in huts. I think my art has saved me. It was there even when I hit the bottom, it was there. It was there to bring me back up. You don't have to be a prisoner of that alcoholism. I have to constantly think about the legends and what the people used to do. We have no choice but to be more creative in order to keep that alive. That helps me to understand who I am where I come from. I'm always living in that era through my art. So let's do a presentation about uh, this Manasiak Paliapik uh, show we had at the Musée. Um, I would like to dedicate this uh, presentation uh, to the artist. We love working with the artists actually at the Musée and especially Manassi when he came to uh, Quebec City was so generous with us to explain his process, artistic process, but also where he's from and uh, was very generous with all his um, experience. I would like also to uh, take the opportunity to uh, thank the Brousseau family for the donation of uh, Manassi's work, but also Inuit uh, art to the museum. So the presentation will be uh, split in uh, four uh, different areas. We'll uh, start with the origin of Manassi's work, the exhibition project, the mount making material, and five case studies uh, Pierre-Luc will go through. So let's start by this beautiful picture just to locate uh, where Arctic Bay is in Nunavut, uh, north of, um, of Canada, where actually Manassi was born in uh, August 1955. He was, um, he was, I have difficulties to find my text, sorry. <laughs> His art is inspired by the heritage of his ancestor and by the deeply respectful relationship between Inuit and animals. He aims to build bridges between his own experience, like events of his uh, life and his culture. Manassi's life was uh, filled with love, but also with very difficult chapters. For example, like many teenagers at that time, Manassi was sent to a residential school in Iqaluit, far from his family and community. There, he was forbidden to speak his language and to explore or even mention, or even mention his culture. Manassi is an example of success. When we look at all of his career as an artist, he's a role model and a source of inspiration for the younger generation and for all of us, really. 
So this is an example when he goes to, uh, back to um, Arctic Bay. He goes to dig to find some uh, whale bones. And like he says, he refers to it as the cycle of life, where he would actually take back the bone to, to continue the life of the animal. And uh, like, he, it's like, um, like he's saying by himself, like he looks at the bone and it's the bone dictating uh, the work he will actually be doing with it. Hi, everyone. So since uh, Menasi is literally carving some raw pieces of nature's, uh, it came up with a few preventive conservation issues. Um, <clears throat> because um, because he, is, uh, he is working on whale bones that he found out on the beach, uh, there is remaining some sands and debris inside the works and uh, porous material It is very friable. So at heavy handling, we need to be very careful because there's always inherent loss of parts. And even when the works are in display inside showcase, uh, we always notice that there are still sands falling apart from the object all along the, the path of the exhibition. The exhibition, I would <clears throat> say that it's the very first time we actually <clears throat> dedicate a solo exhibition to an Inuit artist. Mm. And I don't say that because I'm proud. I think we should have been doing this for several years. We're actually collecting uh, Inuit art. We have um, a huge collection. Uh, we've been doing research on it, mm. but most of the time it was um, showcased in group shows. So fortunately, uh, we're improving on, on that part. So Inuit Universe is curated by Daniel Drouin, who's, who dedicated 15 years of research on our collection at the Musée uh, throughout his career. He, this exhibition presents 40 uh, sculptures made from 1997 to 2003 that talks about life, but also its meaning, time passing by, memory, fear, to name a few of the thematics of the exhibition. All the pieces uh, were, uh, are from the collection of Raymond Brousseau, the great supporter of the artist, and ran for almost uh, two years. You can see the date. It was up since, uh, it's up since June 2021 and is closing next uh, January. So for two years, uh, we needed rugged uh, mouth making. So let's see, uh, let's see a couple of the, the material. Yeah, first of all, I just wanted to introduce a few material I use uh, during uh, the whole preparation of the mounts uh, for this exhibition. Um, <clears throat> our, f our very first approach was to make some epoxy cast interface, which, uh, which helps with uh, many different sculptures that are mostly one part sculptures uh, that have an uneven surface in the footprint area. So the as a epoxy cast uh, interfaces are a very simple way just to straight up the balance of the object and make sure that they are safe on display. Um, for the whole project, I, I used the same uh, kind of epoxy, which was Quickwood Epoxy Putty. Uh, it's a very easy to work with um, as it, since it's a two component into a single stick. So uh, this product been recommended to me, <clears throat> sorry, after uh, making a small workshop with uh, a conservator at the Centre de Conservation du Québec, which are mostly our ref reference uh, for our museums in Quebec City. Here are a few observed precautions uh, when casting an interface. Um, First of all, I always wrap the full object with the Dartec layer, uh, making sure that not anything can go on the object. Uh, after the curing process of the epoxy, I remove the Dartec layer and then I go for a barrier in between the, in between, uh, the object and the mount. Uh, in some cases, I use Paraloid B72 as a barrier so that I'm I am not using it as an adhesive, but just as, as the barrier to seal up the, the epoxy cast interface. And in some other times, uh, it's, uh, a padding was needed. 
when the EPAX interfaces are, um, are not sufficient to uh, offer a good support for the object, I needed to design and build some metal armatures. Um, for the whole project, I used three different kinds of metals, which are pretty common in mount making, such as brass for its ease to work, uh, steel uh, when I needed a stronger support, and also stainless, stainless steel 316 when I needed to make some internal parts, like replacing doubles and stuff like that. Here comes, I'm just making a small uh, part with the, the choice of finish, which is a, a curatorial approach. Um, the curator decided to, um, to go for camouflage amounts for the whole exhibition. Um, and there's a, a quite clear reason for that, since Menacee is often working with objects that, that are into precarious balance. And this precarious balance is kind of the magic spot of balance of works. Uh, and this is a great part of the visual experience that we make of its works. So an obvious mount would kind of break a part of that magic that emanated from the work. Um, for, the, for all the camouflage on the mounts, I used um, uh, Laropol A81 base paint, which is a, a painting that is pretty uh, common in uh, conservation treatments, for, especially for metal surface. Um, for, first, I was working with just a solution of Laropol and pigments. So Laropol is a, is a resin that uh, you can just dissolve in very mild sil solvent like ethanol, and you can increase or decrease the percentage uh, of um, of uh, resin that you put in your mixture, and this will uh, this uh, with this feature you can adapt uh, the the gloss uh, finish of your painting. I have also used uh, Gamblin conservation colors, which are quite the same mixture, but through an industrial uh, manufacturing process, uh, this, these pan sets uh, reach a very high level of concentration of pigments, so which results into um, a very matte finish. Um, so since uh, one of the main feature and advantage of this paint is that since it's only solvent and resin with pigments, um, it dries super fast. It, it's just the sol once the solvent is evaporate, uh, the the paint is totally dry and there's no off gassing period after that uh, since the the solvent is completely gone. <clears throat> In mount making, we don't have many choices of padding, but we still have some, like felt, sweated polyethylene, uh, string tubing, or Volara. In that case, I chose to work with Volara for many features, but the main feature that, that was interesting me was the vibration damp dampening. Uh, I wished that this could help into the loss of fragments and sands while the works were on display uh, after all the mount making process. So this was, a, this was my gamble with this choice. So let's go now in the five uh, case studies to go and see all the vocabulary you've been developing to do this, um, <laughs> this exhibition. So we'll start um, with the shaman in his community in the connection with Universe made in uh, 2000. You can see this picture was taken before Pierre-Luc did the mount, so the central figure, the, the face in the middle is crooked, couldn't stand uh, straight anymore. So I'll be reading a little bit of the traditional culture, the meaning of the shaman. The shaman had the power to heal and serve as a link between humans, animals, and natural elements. He was able to see the spirits of all living beings, to communicate with them, and in certain situations, to calm them. Yeah, so let's take a closer view on this work. Um, this is a three-part assembly, 
And um, like most of the assembly, assembly of uh, Manasi, uh, it's made with dowel, which are made also with organic materials such as caribou antler. Um, the, so we, we see that the problem is in the connection between the base and the whalebone and the upper part, uh, which is the head. Um, so when you have a look closer, you see that there's some masking tapes uh, that, that are coming out of the insertion hole. Uh, and so we needed to take a closer view at that uh, um, by dismantling, dismantling this uh, connection. Also, the work itself is pretty uh, unstable uh, because of the head is crooked. All the parts tend to move really easily. So we decided to cast an interface between the, the base uh, of the sculpture and the head. Uh, but first of all, we needed to, to go find what, what was the compensation material that was used uh, for the dowel insertion. We found out that it was made of cardboard and masking tape. Uh, and uh, compression and all the stress that was into this area um, made that the, 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 um, this material was no, no longer sufficient to, uh, to make the, the head look straight. So I first started by, um, by locking the dowel in the right position with uh, some balsa wood pieces. Then I trimmed it out and had a steel ring around the dowel. Then this steel ring is here to make sure that when, during the casting process of the epoxy interface, the interface wouldn't lock around the dowel. So here is the casting process, which is quite simple. Uh, the, <clears throat> notice that the head is fully wrapped uh, with a later layer of Dartec. Since we are handling epoxy and uh, some parts of the object at the same time during the casting process, it needed to be protect fully protected. Um, <clears throat> sorry. The, um, so that, uh, we found out that the three parts of the object needed to be assembled together in order to make sure that the whole thing is well balanced and that the head is in the right position during the epoxy is curing. Here's the step of finishing the interface. Uh, I just needed to trim out uh, the excess uh, around the, the, the footprint of the head. And then after I sealed the whole epoxy with the Paraloid B72 solution. And after that made a very simple uh, uh, faux finish just to um, make the mount a little less obvious. You can see here the process in three steps with the difference between where we started and where we finished. Now uh, is another example, uh, actually, of a story Manassi had told uh, Daniel Drouin, the curator, um, and the uh, whole team. It's the Lumac legend, which is uh, quite uh, surprising. So this legend recounts the story of a young blind boy persecuted by his own mother, a widow called Lumac. When he succeeds in killing a bear that has attacked their home, the mother tells him that he actually had killed the dog. After having regained his sight with the help of the loons, the boy returns to the camp and sees the bear skin. Furious, he ties the harpoon line around his mother's waist and harpoons a whale, which drags Lumac out of the sea. Yeah, so first of all, uh, the, this is not a raw piece of meat. It, it's, uh, it, it's an alabaster stone. Um, we can see uh, a close-up view uh, into the connection between the two parts of the sculpture. And uh, this is obvious that uh, the, the point of contact between the two pieces is very small, uh, which uh, is problematic uh, in the conservation of the work. It, the, because uh, at any slightly vibration or any shocks, uh, the, some parts of the whale, of the very friable whalebone part could break, and then it will occur into um, 
into more difficult installi installation for the future. So in this case, uh, I needed to combine an epoxy interface with the brass armatures. Um, the, the brass armature is securing the base of the sculpture in place, and then the epoxy interface is here to uh, improve the footprint area of, uh, of, the, of the upper part. Um, during the curing process of the epoxy, I started sculpting it uh, in order to make the continuity of the, of the whalebone. Uh, to make sure that the mount will be less obvious as possible. So here you can see uh, you can see the mount in place with uh, the the junction between the mount and the whalebone part. So a man tormented by his memories, thinking of two women. I don't think I need to read any labels about that. <laughs> this is universal team. Yeah, and of course, as the meaning of, the, of Manassi's culture are pretty close to their materiality, it, this object is in an extremely fragile balance. Um, so the, when you, this is a pretty scary sculpture to install without any mount. Because when, when you put the upper part, which insert into a hole inside the head of the man, uh, the sculpture, the, the upper part start tang tangling from left to right, and the bottom part is tangling back and forth. So the, this, this makes uh, that this uh, sculpture was particularly challenging. <clears throat> So first of all, I needed to secure the base of the sculpture. Uh, I went uh, for uh, small clips uh, to, um, in order to secure it. You can see that the, the longer clips that go uh, over the object has a very small addition of an epoxy interface to make sure that it will follow uh, the, the complex contour of this area. And for the upper part, this was, a, this was more challenging. Um, I need, since I wanted to, to make sure that the upper part won't move inside the cavity, uh, we decided with the curator to fill the, the hole completely to, to make sure that there's a maximum support to the upper part uh, in, uh, a very, in a discreet way as possible. Uh, so the, I created this um, this little epoxy interface that I sculpt and and then paint to mimic the porous material, and uh, the, this part is totally removable since it's just a drop fit uh, inside the cavity in the head. Another very powerful piece: fear of losing one's sculpture. Uh, culture, <laughs> sorry, made in uh, 2000. So after the Second World War, the federal authorities in uh, Canada obliged Inuit to adopt the lifestyle of the southern populations, which involved giving up their nomadic life and becoming sedenta sedentary. Their traditional culture was systematically suppressed and Christianity imposed. In this work, the shaman is being split in two by the devastating effects on his community of the new way of life. So th the first issue with this work is that it was no longer standing on its own, unfortunately, uh, because over the installation, the insertion hole as was crumbling and crumbling and getting larger and larger. So. Uh, at this point, uh, if you put all the parts together, the two, the two parts of the head would slip uh, and go uh, really crooked. I first of all um, secured the two parts with etophone blocks uh, temporarily. And then I started to use some thin brass and uh, paper in order to create some templates to go bend uh, all my material inside my workshop. So here's the first 
fit test. Um, notice that the thickness of the brass didn't allow to perfectly follow the contour of the object, which was a problem uh, since uh, very small points of contact can make some breaks occur at any time during install or uh, even during display. So I fill up the gap between uh, the between the uh, the brass armature and the object with epoxy, and uh, and then after after I started to camouflage the mount. So and here is a small quick tip uh, just for the end painting process. Um, I am always leaving the dartex layer around the object until the mount is bad. Uh, so this, this helps a lot since this nylon film, uh, taking advantage of uh, the transparency of the nylon film, I can uh, replicate some details of the sculpture while looking through the temporary barriers. Here's the last test fit and the final display of the work. That brings us to the last case study. So, Tali Layuk, the goddess of, um, goddess of the sea. Uh, this work is one of the favorites of the visitor. It looks really light, it looks like it's swimming, but uh, you'll see that it's quite a challenge. So, in Inuit mythology, the legend of Tali Layuk, or the Senna, remains the best known. Uh, and her story has been passed down from generation to generation. The goddess, half woman, half fish, reigns over all animals of the sea. When she's angry, Talilayuk holds the animals in her hair, and only the intervention of the shaman can free them back. So, at the first time we installed this work, like 10 years ago, without, mount, uh, without any mount, um, me and my colleague put the, uh, the uh, upper part um, uh, on the caribou antler. And when we leave the object, it took like 10, 10 seconds before it starts moving like this. And during this movement, uh, the, we, we saw the, a loss of fragments and the hole was crumbling with this. So this, the, the, big, the biggest issue with this work is to be able to have the right position uh, during the install, um, which is quite fairly impossible without any guide for this. And over, over the installation, it was uh, an, an evidence that once a day this work could no longer uh, go on display without the mount. So we didn't want to reach that point. This is why we decided to make a mount uh, in, in order to ensure the preventive conservation of the object, but also to guide the installation. So I first made a, a template uh, made of cardboard, uh, which I digitize and vectorize in order to send it uh, to laser cut the outline of the object. Out of a, Oops. oh, I'm <laughs> Out of a half an inch, inch uh, thick uh, steel piece. After that, I just needed to weld and braze all the parts together. Uh, notice on the last image that I just needed to mix uh, brass and steel together with brazing uh, in order to take advantage of uh, the ease uh, to bend of brass. During the templating pro process, a two millimeter um, clearance been observed in order to let some space to cast an epoxy interface between the mount and the object. This could help to follow the complex contour of the object uh, perfectly and also to make sure that the first fit test won't uh, damage any part of the object. After that, that was literally uh, a huge faux finish journey. Uh, uh, I, 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 I spent so many times on this, uh, on this mount that I, I didn't know at which point I should leave it, and 
I think that if I would have listening to me, uh, I wouldn't be there with you and I will be still painting this mount. <laughs> So, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we could say that that was one positive thing about COVID. We would never have been able to give uh, Pierre-Luc that much time before uh, an install of an exhibition to actually do this. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, it's a thrill, it's really um, a treat for me to be here with you at the Getty since yesterday I'm listening to all your experience. Uh, it's a very young practice for us in uh, Quebec City. We're new to the business, let's say, <laughs> and we're very grateful and proud of uh, Pierre-Luc, who's alone doing this in our institution amongst the other um, technician installing uh, the exhibition or on the side of collection or art handler. So um, I just wanted to say that you're a very beautiful group of people and good community of practice. And uh, I think, uh, I hope at one point I'll be able to welcome you in Quebec City. We'll see. <laughs> so. Let's finish by thanking the whole, uh, the whole team uh, who worked on the exhibition, of course. Uh, we'll take some questions. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I can kick off the questions with a virtual question. For the last mount, because the epoxy is so fitted to the object, is it difficult to remove the object from the mount? Uh, no, can you can you go back any a bit? Uh, why it comes up? What? Yeah, just oh, that's great. Yeah, without the full finish, it's easier to understand. Um, as you can see, this mount is a two part. Uh, there's a, a full plate under the rock, and then after there's a, a small pin which is notched to receive the upper part of the mount. So. During the install, we, we just uh, put on the, the base of the mount, installed the rock which come with the caribou antler, and then after that we put the, the upper part of, of the mount and then screw uh, the, the two me mechanical attachments you can see in the, in the picture. And then after that we're just dropping the, the main figure uh, on it. We have another virtual question. When pairing your contoured brass pieces with the epoxy cast pieces, the fill, do they attach together as one piece, or do they remain in place by using pressure? Yes, it's, at the, it's attaching pretty well as long uh, as uh, the mount is clean. Uh, in my case, I, I often just clean it with ethanol before casting. Nice job, Pierre-Luc. Um, I have a question over here. Um, how closely did you work with Manasi on these objects with the mounts? Did you have to ask him permission or to do these things, or was he resistant or anything? Or, um... Um, for the work with Manasi, uh, um, since Manasi is living far from Quebec, I needed to refer to the curator, mostly. Um, and uh, we had... Um, we, it, it was a, it was not a simple simple path to to um, to ask questions to directly to Manasi. It was better working with the curator. And Annie, maybe you have a few um, inputs about that. Yeah, actually, it was a very political <laughs> uh, action at the musée because of the acquisition process. Uh, but mainly what we um, uh, learn out of this experience is that when he came with uh, Annie's kid, uh, well, they're married, uh, his wife, they actually um, talked about all the pieces uh, one by one, explaining the meaning of it and the link with his own uh, life and, and history. And... Um, all of this was written down because, you know, like every museum, we're always uh, asking ourselves from where we're talking about, what's our perspective, and who should be curating this, and how should we handle um, those stories, who should be actually r r writing the labels. 
And um, it was very important for us, like we had access to the artists for the content and we uh, realized how much we actually um, uh, made him contribute to that part of the text. And he's an older uh, artist. It was demanding also um, all the, that work to create the exhibition. And so when the Mao making uh, arrived in the, in the development of the project, he was aware of that after the, the fact or, or along the way, let's say. Uh, and he was super impressed, and then we realized that we cut him from a huge pleasure for him because his craftsmanship and uh, all the, the, you know, what he loves doing when he's doing sculpture, it's actually that. And he was so amazed with uh, Pierre-Luc's uh, work, he wanted to actually talk about this. And uh, then we thought, okay, that's, that's again us going <laughs> through a process and blocking something happening. So I think that uh, what we learned from this is that when artists are coming to the, the institution to develop uh, an exhibition, it's not just for content-wise, uh, we should be uh, doing those uh, sessions of work, but actually bring uh, people from all different um, uh, section directions and so forth, and to actually access um, the, the magic, because, you know, there's nothing like having the artist talking about its uh, art. So, unfortunately, in that process, uh, Pierre-Luc didn't, uh, didn't work closely, uh, but it's not because <laughs> we didn't want it or something like that. Yeah. Beautiful job. With some of those uh, epoxy pieces where you're uh, creating um, a mold inside of those like kind of bone structures, uh, because of how delicate it was, uh, the epoxy that I've worked with before feels kind of stiff. Was there any worry about potentially damaging those structures as you're trying to fit those in there? Uh, you mean uh, to the uh, the interface to get stuck in the cavity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was really <laughs> worried about that. <laughs> um, I, um, I I I carefully looked if there was undercut inside the, the cavity. Uh, there was indeed. Uh, so I just filled them with uh, some little food wrap, just making some small parts, and then filling it, and also. Um, the Dartek layer is making also a little loose between the interface and the object. And also, Quickwood has a fast drying, a fast curing process, um, not like Epoxy Sculpt, which has a slower, a slower uh, pro curing process. So uh, the, this means that the, the, ca the interface will shrink a little bit more during the curing process. So all these factors kind of help to remove the, the piece. Um, so if the curing process is faster. I'm just wondering how much time you had to like sculpt that one piece. Uh, which one? This one? Uh, sorry, the, the one where you kind of mimicked the bone. Uh, might have been Oh, that. yeah. Um, this one went a bit faster, but the, 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 uh, I really lost the time count uh, into this project since uh, I worked on it with always three objects on the bench. Uh, because of the curing process, I, I, I've been always like mixing a batch of epoxy, making three mounts at the same time. Uh, but for the for the making the um, making the texture, it went during the curing process, so it took less than 20 minutes. And uh, for uh, notice also that the the epoxy I'm using is really close to the color of the whalebone, so for the full finish part, it went. Pretty well. It wasn't wasn't that long. The preparation was longer than making the mount itself. Thank you. Hi, I had a question regarding potential storing. I understand that whale bone becomes more fragile the drier it gets. Do you have any concerns 
for the deinstallation or storage of this if it does have to move or just be stored? Um, what are your plans for that? Uh, do you mean about the uh, atmosphere condition or uh, more about the packing uh, for storage? I'm curious about everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I, have, I have colleagues that work uh, in, the, in the collection departments which will make all the storage mounts. Uh, for the deinstallation, I have no worries since uh, I didn't use any adhesive on any parts of, uh, uh, during the mount making pro uh, process, so everything is easily removable. And uh, most of the time for the closer fits on object with metal armatures, I always made some mechanical uh, connection, uh, which are mostly in strategic points uh, that, that makes it easy to remove it safely. Uh, but I'm more worried about uh, where I'm going to put all these mounts after. <laughs> <laughs> since they will not be in the same location of the, uh, as the object, of course. 